Here's a few shots of the workshop. Uh, you'll notice there's about seven or eight craftsmen in total. Pretty typical for the workshops we do business with. Uh, there's Yorgo in the corner in black. Uh, all of our designers work alongside their employees. That's pretty much prerequisite for us. It says a lot about the designer. Here's Yorgo. Uh, we tried making a short video of him talking about his business, but between him and his daughters, nobody could keep a straight face long enough. So we're going to settle for this photo for you. Today we'll be showing this ring being made. It's a good subject because it shows some common historical elements such as granulation and filigree ropes. But it also gives an appreciation for the amount of work involved, particularly with the shaping and placement of the decorative rings. To make the granules, the craftsman just takes small cuts of gold wire and heats them under a torch. Uh, the melted material automatically pulls itself into a sphere, as you'll see here. Boom. Uh, here we see four being made, but a craftsman will typically make several hundred at a shot. This tends to be on the chores list of some of the apprentice craftsmen, along with making filigree ropes, uh, doing some of the finishing, and even making gold dust, which gets used to fuse larger pieces together. Now you'll notice that the, the little pieces of gold, uh, once they've been under the torch, turn black. Uh, that's something that basically gets undone the second they dunk it under cold water. What's happening now is the apprentice craftsman is taking a lot of these granulation balls, and grouping them together uh, into sort of like prefabricated design modules. Uh, right there, uh, what he's firing up right now is the uh, granulation pyramid with three balls. Uh, next to it, the one he's going to fire up next, this one, uh, is basically the same thing except with four balls, so it's you know symmetrical. Uh, again, these are basically, he, he's making design elements. He, he, the, the easy step is to make the granulation ball itself, and the next step is to form design elements out of them. From there, they go on to the master craftsman, who's going to take the individual uh, granulation balls and the granulation pyramids, too, and start setting them onto the ring face. That's, that's our ring face right there. Uh, you'll notice in the center, there's a, like a bezel setting already put there for the stone that they're going to use. Uh, and it's black, of course, because it's been fired up a bunch of times, but a little dunk in water will cure that. Off to the left, uh, you'll see a petri dish full of gold dust. That gets used as an adhesive. Uh, first, it just helps, uh, helps the pieces stick together a little bit while the, uh, while the craftsman is setting things. Uh, but then, once it's put onto the torch, it's going to melt faster than the other elements and wind up acting as a glue as a result. Uh, you'll notice how much time uh, and diligence uh, the, the craftsman takes in just looking at this piece over and over again to make sure all the uh, little granulation balls are in the right place. You'll also notice what he's using right now. That's a feather. Uh, it comes from a certain kind of duck that they farm in Hungary, uh, only in Hungary. Uh, it's, and there's only two of those feathers on each duck. Uh, so what happened was Yorgo uh, the Mascos was looking through some old, uh, some old manuals and some old texts and found out that 2,000 years ago, uh, this is what they used to do this particular task. Uh, they, they got this particular feather to set granulation balls uh, on uh, faces of rings and other pieces. So uh, this is Yorgo. He went and got the feathers because he wanted to do it like they did. Uh, moving on to filigree ropes then. Uh, essentially, it's pretty easy to make. You just take two long pieces of, of gold uh, strand, uh, wrap them around a chair at the other side of the room, and uh, use a drill like this uh, to just start twisting them together. Now, granted, they didn't have those electric drills 2,000 years ago. They, they tried doing this manually, and they did it successfully a number of times, uh, and then Yargo just gave up because it was just too much of a hassle. It took too long and people were tripping over the wire as they tried to cross the room. Uh, the, the filigree rope will be used as a decorative element on our ring face. There's actually going to be two of them on our ring face. Okay, going back to our ring face, uh, you'll see that now it's, it's back to gold. Somebody dunked it in the water. Uh, all the granulation balls and granulation pyramids have been neatly arranged around the, uh, the bezel. You can see the pink tourmaline uh, right there uh, past the petri dish uh, that will be used uh, in that bezel uh, on the ring face. Uh, but right now, uh, the, the craftsman is working on this little gold loop. 
which seems so insignificant and, and so, you know, it, it just seems like it would be an easy thing to, to figure out how to get a little gold loop on this ring face, but I, he takes his time. Uh, it's it's pretty good show of diligence, actually. Uh, it's it's always interesting to, to me to, to see, you know, the care that goes into these things. Uh, right now, by the way, he just put on some of the, uh, the gold dust uh, to seal this loop together. And now he's going to, uh, to fire it up and, yeah, there you go, make that happen. Okay, so now it's a solid loop. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Uh, all of the design elements uh, that you see on these pieces, uh, especially from the Mascos, uh, take an extraordinary amount of time uh, to make and to adjust, uh, you know, shape-wise and size-wise, and to place onto the final piece. Uh, the amount of time that this craftsman is spending with this loop is very similar to the amount of time he'll spend on, you know, well, that, that array of, of granulation files, obviously, but on making a rosette uh, or, or partial floral rosettes or, or, or any other piece. Uh, it's just uh, they really they really do take their time, but it, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, that it does take a lot of time. What's the opportunity cost? I mean, it, they could just as easily uh, do things to save time. They could make a mold out of uh, some hard wax, and every time they need to make this ring, they could just pour gold and voila, there would be the ring. Uh, but they don't do that. Uh, and it's it's uh, it's kind of like they're more interested in the method than they are in the result um, because the real spirit of the affair if you ask the right kind of people is one of responsibility to a tradition now I'm a New Yorker and you know to me if somebody came up to me and said that then I'd be like alright you know you're doing some marketing good job <laughs> um, but uh, but it's true, I, you know it's it's undeniable true. Uh, people have been making jewelry in Athens for three thousand years, and, and in Greater Greece for five thousand years. The industry has survived occupations by the Persians, the Romans, and the Ottomans, uh, the Venetians, uh, even Nazi Germany, and more recently a junta in the early seventies. Uh, it's just astounding uh, that through all of that, they managed to hold on to this particular industry. I mean, imagine that. I mean, they, they kept gold from the Nazis. I mean, it's, they got some moxie, you know, to, to, to keep this going like that, um, through situations like that. Uh, this is no joke. Uh, this is the real thing. And these are the people whose turn it is now uh, to keep that tradition alive, uh, to keep it going. Uh, it's really, it's just amazing to me. Um, but still, I mean, just like the rest of the world and just like in other industries, uh, a big part of this industry is being sent off to Asia. There's automated manufacturing going on in China and Indonesia and India. Uh, and to make matters worse, it's the bigger names that are doing it. The companies with the greatest ability to foster and protect the tradition by hiring and training new craftsmen are the ones leaving town and shedding jobs locally. Uh, it, you know, it's a real shame, but uh, you know, it's it's everybody wants to make more money, and that's what some people are choosing to do. It's their right, so they do it. Um, anyway, it's it's one of the reasons we stick to uh, smaller family-run workshops. Uh, you you get the people that care most about design and their product uh, and everything else, um, and we've never regretted that at all. Uh, sometimes things do take a little bit longer. Uh, you'll see that in our feedback. Uh, but but this is what you get. You get hands-on uh, experience. This is, not, this is not China. This is not uh, some automated deal. Um, somebody that cares about uh, a very old tradition is, is taking care of you. Uh, a number of our customers, I should mention this, a number of our customers have offered compliments to our designers over the past four years. Uh, probably Evie and I both say this, the best part of our business is that we have the opportunity to relay those compliments to our designers. Um, he's just, actually right now he's just firing everything up and finally securing that loop to the piece, uh, to the ring face. Um, 
I, I should make a movie of just uh, our designer's smiles from getting those compliments. Uh, they, they thank you back and they compliment you back, I assure you. So, uh, thank you for your time and, uh, and thank you very much for visiting our store and thank you very much for visiting the, the Masco's workshop with us today.